Just a word of warning before we begin. This episode discusses some incidents of assault, and while they are very much paranormal in nature, some may find the details to be disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. The streets of London were a place of fear in 1790. There had been dozens of attacks, all reported by women. A man, it seems, had been stepping out of the shadows or from around corners and pricking them with a pin. Sometimes he was covert about it. There are reports that he fitted a bouquet of flowers with a sharp object and would ask women if they'd like to smell it. Who could resist? Others say he attached small blades to his knees and then used them to stab women in the backs of the legs. And as the story spread, so too did the panic. They called him the London Monster, and within weeks, the entire city was on alert. In the autumn of 1803, the people of London were obsessed with a new story. It seemed that a ghost had been seen in the Hammersmith area of the city. There were whispers that he was the victim of a suicide, doomed to haunt our world forever, and many people claimed to have seen him. After months of hysteria and rumor, a police officer actually witnessed the ghost while on patrol. Francis Smith pulled his gun, called for the fiend to stop, and fired upon it. His shot was true, and the ghost fell limp to the ground. It fell because it was, after all, just a man. Thomas Millwood had been a plasterer by trade, and because of this, he wore all white clothing. Officer Smith was tried for murder and found guilty. Few things can unite a city like fear. Hysteria spreads in much the same way the plague moved across Europe in the 17th century. But that's not the unusual part. What's truly odd is the depths to which people will go to believe these fears, how easily they fall in with the public outcry and believe whatever it is they're told. For as horrible as the London monster and the Hammersmith ghost stories sound, a new fear swept the city decades later. This fear permeated so deep and spread so fast that it left a mark still visible today. Because fear, even when it's built on lies, can spread like fire. And sometimes, on rare occasions, there's a good reason why. I'm Aaron Mankey, and this is Lore. On a cool September night in 1837, Polly Adams was on her way home from the Green Man, a public house in the Blackheath area of London. She was with friends, and they talked and laughed as they walked toward Shooter's Hill. Nearly home, the group was startled when a figure seemed to jump out of the darkness of an alley. Before anyone could react, the figure grabbed at Polly. According to her later deposition with the police, the stranger was clad in a black cloak, but his eyes seemed to burn with light. Oddly, she remembered that the man smelled of sulfur, and then added, as if it were a normal thing to notice about a midnight attacker, that he also spat blue fire from his mouth. Rather than help her, Polly's three travel companions quickly ran away into the night, afraid for their lives. And rightly so. The attacker ripped through Polly's blouse with hands that seemed more like claws than anything else, but after tearing at the flesh of her stomach, the figure stopped. Pushing her to the ground, it turned and bounded away into the night. One month after Polly Adams walked home from the Green Man, Mary Stevens was making her way back to work after a short visit with her parents in nearby Battersea. Mary worked as a servant in a home on Lavender Hill, just south of the Thames, and decided to cut through Clapham Common. Maybe not the smartest decision, no matter what century you live in. Yet Mary did just that, and set off on a quick walk through the dark trees and bushes toward her place of employment. Near the edge of the park, a figure jumped out of the shadows. The man grabbed her and pushed her to the ground, where he began to kiss her. Mary struggled, but the man's grip was beyond tight. According to Mary, the stranger then ripped at her clothing with a clawed hand that was 
cold and clammy as those of a corpse, she said. Afraid for her life, she screamed, forcing the attacker to release her and flee the scene. The screams brought several nearby residents to her aid, and a search was organized to locate the stranger, but no trace of him could be found. The following evening, in the very same neighborhood where Mary Stevens lived, another dark figure was spotted. This time, rather than an assault, a mysterious person stepped out onto the path of an oncoming carriage. The coachman, surprised by the appearance of the dark figure, lost control of the carriage before crashing into a building. The coachman was severely injured, and the mysterious man cried out with a ringing, high-pitched laugh that chilled witnesses to the core. And then, as if his work were done, the man jumped over a nearby wall and escaped. The wall, mind you, was over nine feet tall. Three months later, the Lord Mayor of London, a man named Sir John Cowan, spoke up at a public session at the Mansion House about a complaint he had received in the form of a letter. This letter was anonymous, but the writer claimed to be a resident of Peckham, close to Battersea, and the 1837 attacks. The letter described how these attacks had all been a prank put on by an unnamed aristocrat as part of a dare. Researchers have speculated for over a century as to who the nobleman might have been, but no theories have ever panned out. Later in January of 1838, the mayor showed off a pile of letters he had received from people in and around London, all claiming to have witnessed, or been the victim of, similar attacks to what Polly Adams and Mary Stevens had suffered. Though the claims can't be proven, some letters reported that people actually died of fright, while others were permanently traumatized by their encounters with this mysterious figure, and many of the reports contained eerily similar pieces of information. This stranger was said to be able to leap over tall fences and walls. He was always described as having red eyes and clawed hands, and he always got away. Like a fever, the hysteria spread throughout London and the surrounding countryside. It didn't matter that the mayor was skeptical of the whole thing, People everywhere seemed to be catching glimpses of dark shapes, leaping tall buildings, and terrorizing their neighbors and servants. Like any movement or public experience, the people of London went looking for a name. What would they call the creature, human or not, who was the center of all these stories? And by late winter of 1838, they found it. A name that would forever become part of Victorian folklore. They called him spring Jack. Up to this point, sightings of spring Hill Jack had consisted of second-hand accounts and attacks on women with little power to demand attention. But in the winter of 1838, all of that changed. On the night of February 28th, Lucy and Margaret Scales set off from the home of their brother, who worked as a butcher on Narrow Street in the Limehouse District. History hasn't remembered their destination. All we know is that around 8.30 p.m. that night, the two young women walked off into the shadows naively confident in their own safety. Minutes later, their brother the butcher heard screams off in the distance, in the direction of a street known as Green Dragon Alley. When he realized that the voice was that of his sister Margaret, he dashed off to find her. I like to imagine he still had on his bloody apron, and most likely picked up a meat cleaver before making the run. When he found his sisters, Margaret was on her knees in the dark alley, Lucy's body cradled in her arms. The young woman wasn't dead, but she was unconscious, and Margaret was hysterical. As their brother helped the two women home, she told him the story of what had happened. They had stepped into the alley, but a few paces in, a dark figure stepped out of the shadows and approached them quickly. Lucy had been standing in front of her sister, just a few paces separating the two women. Because of this, it was Lucy who took the full brunt of the attack. The figure, she said, was that of a man. Margaret described him as very tall and thin, dressed in a manner of a gentleman and wrapped in a large, dark cloak. He held a lantern known then as a bullseye, a small, round type, typically carried by officers of the law, and maybe that was why the women let him approach so carelessly. But that's when things took a turn for the worse. According to Margaret's report, which she filed later with the office of the police in Lambeth, the cloaked man stepped close to Lucy, 
and spat blue flames at her face. The flames, she claimed, erupted from the man's mouth, and the sight of them blinded and shocked Lucy, who collapsed on the spot. Margaret worried that she was next, but she had also been concerned for Lucy, who lay on the cobblestone, writhing in the throes of some kind of seizure. And then, as if his mission had been accomplished, the dark figure leapt over Margaret and onto the roof of a nearby house, before vanishing into the London darkness. Sometime during the same week, the shadowy figure of Spring Hill Jack made another appearance. Jane Elsop was reading a book around 9 p.m. She lived in one of the nicer neighborhoods in the East End of London, along with her father and two sisters. And on the night in question, she was closest to the front door, which is probably why she was the one who heard the shouting. From across the small yard, a voice had cried out in the darkness. There was a gate there that allowed access to the property and served as a small measure of security. But the voice that had shouted belonged to someone professing to be a police officer. An officer, in fact, that claimed to have captured none other than spring Jack. The man had called out for a light, and Jane, being a dutiful citizen, grabbed a lit candle and exited her home to deliver it to the officer. As she handed it to him, the man tossed off his cloak, exposing his true appearance by the light of the flickering flame. This was no police officer. What Jane saw took her breath away. The figure was clothed in what appeared to be a tight-fitting, one-piece suit of white fabric, along with a metal helmet. According to Jane, the man's eyes glowed red and were set within a face more hideous and frightening than any she had seen before. And then, without warning, the figure spat blue flames from his mouth. This time, though, Jack wasn't content to stop there. With Jane partially blinded by the flash of bright flames, he reached out and grasped her with his arms. In the report that her family later filed that night with the same Lambeth police office where Lucy Scales told her story, Jane further described her assault. The man, if that's what he really was, tore into her dress with fingers that felt to her like they were metal claws. He tore through her dress and then cut through her skin, ripping deep, painful gashes in her abdomen. Jane screamed, perhaps from the pain or maybe from her primal fear. And then she ran. Her front door was just meters away and open, and so she bolted quickly for that safe sliver of light in the shadow-covered facade of the house. She was mere steps from the doorway, a heartbeat from safety, when Jack caught up. His clawed hands grabbed at her neck and shoulder. Sharp, metallic fingers tore at Jane's flesh. Patches of hair were pulled free from her scalp. Blood was everywhere. Her family had heard her screams, though. And just as her attacker was slashing at her face, her father reached toward her from within the house. Two arms, outstretched to touch one target. One to harm, one to save. Thankfully, it was Jane's father who won. Grabbing her by the hand, he pulled hard and brought her back inside, slamming the door shut behind her. Many of the details surrounding Spring Hill Jack, details that were so out of the ordinary and unusual, seem to be echoed in each new eyewitness account. The red eyes, the white bodysuit, the sharp claws. But something set Jane Alsop's story apart from all the others. You see, she was well off. Not part of the elite, but high enough up the social ladder that her story caught the attention of the local newspaper, as well as the police. And when the upper class feels threatened, they take action. When word spread that Jack was hunting women throughout London, the police began to arrest suspects, although none were ever brought to trial. Groups of vigilantes banded together and patrolled the streets at night, both to assist the police in protecting the people of London, and also with the hope of capturing the mysterious attacker. Upon reading about the attacks that had begun to plague the good people of London, One 70-year-old retired military veteran actually dusted off his guns, pulled on his boots, and rode off in search of the monster responsible. Although he was never successful in capturing the mysterious Spring Hill Jack, or even setting eyes on it, the gesture did much to calm the nerves of the locals. And how could it not? He was, after all, 
the Duke of Wellington, the man who fought Napoleon and won. Needless to say, the stories began to spread. Several penny dreadfuls were written about the mysterious Jack, whose exploits were perfect for the cheap, serialized fiction that the genre was built around. In theaters around London, several plays appeared that featured the subject. Even the Punch and Judy puppet shows across London found a way to incorporate this shadowy public menace. In shows that once featured the devil, performers changed his name to spring Jack. There were, of course, a handful of additional sightings over the years to come, but while some of them stayed in the southwest area of London and Surrey County beyond that, others popped up in more distant locations. One report in Northamptonshire described an encounter with a creature that was, and I quote, the very image of the devil himself with horns and eyes of flame. In Devon, an investigation was mounted to find the man assaulting women in that area, and the suspect's description had some similarities to Spring Hill Jack. Lincolnshire, on the eastern coast of England, was the location of another documented sighting in the 1870s. One witness described a caped figure who was seen leaping over cottages in a small village. When the locals grabbed their guns and tried to shoot the figure, they claimed that they could hear the bullets strike him, but the only result was a metallic ringing sound. Jack got away. One of the last encounters of note occurred in Aldershot on the very edge of Surrey County. It was geographically closer to London than most of the other 1870s sightings, and some researchers believe that this proximity to the original reports lend this story more validity. On a night in August of 1877, Private John Reagan was standing guard in a small booth near a military munitions depot. While inside, he claimed to hear something metallic being scraped along the wood of the booth. He stepped outside, rifle in hand, and patrolled the area to find the source. When he was satisfied that nothing was there, he headed back to his station inside the booth. And that's when something touched him. Looking up, he saw the figure of a tall man, wrapped in a cloak and wearing a metal helmet. Then the figure leapt into the air and landed behind him. Reagan pointed his weapon at the figure and called out for a name, but he claims the visitor, whoever it was, simply laughed. The soldier fired to no effect, and the figure advanced. And then, without warning, blue flames erupted from his mouth. That's when Reagan did what any good soldier would do under the circumstances. He ran for his life. spring Jack never left the public mind. But as the legend slowly settled into popular culture, reports of actual appearances became less and less frequent. And then, just as Jack had seemed to cross the threshold into mythic territory, he did what every eyewitness claimed he was gifted at. He disappeared. There's a lesson deep inside the story of spring Jack. Like all of the most powerful and devastating diseases of the last thousand years, ideas have a tendency to spread like fire. Today we use the term viral, and in many ways that's really close to the truth. Fear, panic, and hysteria are all communicable diseases. And when a culture is infected, sometimes there's no way to stop it. But unlike the plague or some new strain of the flu, it stands to reason that we could, at the very least, calm our fears and put out the fires of hysteria. So why is it so hard to do so? spring Jack is just one of countless examples that have been repeated all around the world throughout history. You would think that we have figured it out by now. Maybe we actually like mass hysteria. Not the hysteria itself, mind you. What I mean is, what if there's something about being part of a larger story that resonates with people? It binds us together. It unites us in a global conversation. It builds community. The big fears never really go away. Although spring Hill Jack disappeared from the public eye in the last decade of the 19th century, some people still think he's around. In 1995, a school in a small West Surrey village was closed by the town. The students and teachers wanted to mark the occasion, and so they put on a disco-themed celebration to say goodbye to each other and the school building they loved. That night, as the party was winding down, 
a handful of students ran back into the school screaming about something they had seen outside. When asked by the teachers about it, these students all told the same story. They had all left the party earlier and had been hanging out near the playground. While there, a shadowy figure had approached them in the darkness. As the shape moved closer, they saw more details. The man wore black boots and a dark hooded cloak, but it was what they saw beneath the cloak that frightened them the most. A one-piece suit of white cloth and glowing red eyes. As the story of Spring Hill Jack demonstrates well, people have been fascinated for a very long time by breaking the laws of physics. In the age of superhero films, it's easy to take flying humans for granted. But in Victorian England, that was captivating. But it's not the first time people have flown in folklore. And I've tracked down one more example that's sure to deliver. When it comes to thrills and chills. Stick around through this brief sponsor break to hear all about it. Joseph always had a way of rising above his peers. That hadn't always been the case, though. As a child, he was known for his lack of education. He had these moments in the village school where he would slip away, mentally, and would miss entire lectures or questions. It earned him the nickname Open Mouth because, well, I think that one makes a lot of sense on its own. Having been born in Italy at the start of the 17th century, there were few career options available to Joseph without proper training. He didn't have a knack for most jobs and lacked the focus to get better at them. So he struggled, and this went on for years, until finally in 1625, he found some place to belong. The church. It wasn't always perfect, but Joseph managed to catch on and work his way into the hearts of the people around him. He was passionate, if not a bit unfocused and prone to odd behavior. And eventually, that odd behavior would get him in trouble. In 1628, shortly after taking his vows as a priest in the Franciscan order, Father Joseph was taken to Naples for examination. He was interviewed by his superiors, but in the end they found nothing wrong with him. As a result, he was allowed to return to ministry, but they also kept a close eye on him, right there in Naples, where he served at St. Gregory's. As always, though, it would never be business as usual for Father Joseph. He was simply too well known for his unusual behavior. Still, what happened next was something few could have predicted. One day, while a number of the priests were inside St. Gregory's saying their prayers, a few of them glanced over to see Father Joseph sitting in a corner. It was his preferred place of prayer, off away from the others, but still in the room with them. This time, though, when the others looked at him, they claimed that he did something astonishing. Father Joseph stood up, and after a moment of silence with his eyes closed, he levitated off the floor. It's not that he stood taller, or that the shadows moved around him and made it appear as if he floated. No, Father Joseph literally flew up from the floor, ever so slowly, and then moved in the direction of the altar. A moment later, that's where he touched down. Those who were in the room with him said it was amazing, and not just because of the flying. You see, Joseph stood there with his robes far too close to the candles of the altar to be safe, and yet they never once caught fire. Then, after a few moments, everything reversed, and Joseph levitated up again and flew back to his spot in the corner. Naturally, the other priests were floored. No pun intended, I promise. It was a miracle on so many levels, and that meant that they needed others to see it. And being in Italy, that also meant they could travel to the Vatican, where Father Joseph was asked to repeat his amazing powers of flight in front of Pope Urban VIII, along with many other high-level church officials. And he did it. He levitated so high off the floor, and for so long, that he had to be asked to return by one of the men in the room. And that's the truly unusual part of this story. Because while it might be easy to assume he was faking it in some way if he did it in private and then later claimed it, 
What motive did all of these others in the room have for maintaining a lie? The years that followed were full of more of the same levitation. It was never something done as a performance. Instead, at random times, Joseph would simply float toward the ceiling. And he did it for decades. When he passed away in 1663, he was so well known for his miraculous flying that one early biographer joked that this time the spirit had flown, leaving the body behind. Life after death has proven to be easier on the flying father. Joseph was canonized by the Catholic Church in 1763. In the century since, he has become known as the patron saint of poor students, test takers, and, of course, those who travel by air. This episode of Lore was researched, written, and produced by me, Aaron Mankey, with music by Chad Lawson. Lore is much more than just a podcast. There's a book series available in bookstores and online, and two seasons of the television show on Amazon Prime Video. Check them both out if you want more lore in your life. I also make and executive produce a whole bunch of other podcasts, all of which I think you'd enjoy. My production company, Grim and Mild, specializes in shows that sit at the intersection of the dark and the historical. And you can learn more about all of our shows and everything else going on over in one central place, grimandmild.com. You can also follow this show on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search for Lore Podcast, all one word, and then click that follow button. And when you do, say hi. I like it when people say hi. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>